you're all doing at the moment when you're not speaking, so you can ensure your camera and your mic are turned off. We are going to be recording the session, which has already started. So please keep that in mind if you're posting anything in the chat. I put at the start the connection details. So if you do get kicked out or your connection fails, please try out to rejoin us. And please use the chat function during the session for any thoughts, comments, questions. This time we'll try and raise these at the end. And if you'd like to use the raise hand function during the session, please do. This is not the same as some of the other sessions today where I'm imparting you with lots of information that we have on EU exit, the determinations review that's taking place, anything like that. This is more around the, the ideas that you should be thinking about in terms of your primary authority partnerships. Um, we've used the term MOT or health check, doing it in terms of when was the last time you thought about these things? Are you doing everything that you can be in the manner that you can be? Because um, for those that don't know me, uh, I was a trading standards officer for 20 years. I was heavily involved in primary authority since its inception. And I know that often you can operate the scheme in the manner that your authority has set up. And it's very difficult to look behind the curtain of a, a neighbour to see how they work out their costs, for example. Um, there is something with our new primary authority regional groups that hopefully will get people to collaborate and share a bit more. But please use this session to raise questions. My colleague Caroline Clark is going to be monitoring the chat. But if you put your hand up, um, we can come to you for discussion of any points. So a PAMOT, it's a, a business adage that often, especially self-employed people, spend too long working in their business and never make time to work on their business. Obviously, primary authority has a commercial element to it, and so we owe it to ourselves, our authorities and our partners to deliver the best service that we can. And that often requires taking time to back to see where you are and see how you can improve. And as it is a commercial service that you're providing, businesses can go elsewhere. They can ask you for information on, for example, how you work out your costs. They can make complaints about the level of service they're getting. So making sure that you're delivering the right standard and the right way is going to benefit everyone. So what we're going to look at today, a little bit of what I call sort of the basic elements of primary authority. We're going to touch on costs, giving advice, measuring the quality and some final considerations. So basic checks. Um, is the information on the PA register correct? You can't get more basic than that. Um, are the contact officers on both sides of the partnership correct? Um, I know people move on and it's very difficult to think about all the additional things, but when was the last time you checked everything was up to date? Are the company contacts still the same? Are the officers delivering the advice still competent? Obviously, with the last eight months, we've had a difficult environment, but training, CPD records, all of that needs to be kept up to date. The statutory guidance requires officers to have the skills, the knowledge and the expertise um, to deliver the service. Um, so making sure that is up to date and you're able to demonstrate that the officers providing the advice are appropriately competent in the areas that they're advising on. Published advice. Um, again, sort of standard things. When was the published advice last reviewed? The, the statutory guidance requires there to be robust arrangements for review of the advice. But when was the last time published advice was reviewed? Do you have a system, for example, of reviewing advice that is published at a set interval? So, for example, when I used to operate within a prime authority environment, we would set 18 months, two years, dependent on what the advice was. In some cases, it could be three months, six months, but having a process in place 
to actually go back and review it because obviously legislation changes, the product may change. So having a standard review system in place is protection for you, the assured advice and the business. Making contact with your primary authority. When was the last time you actually spoke to your primary authority? Um, partnerships need to be actively maintained to get the most out of them. And obviously during the last six months, businesses may have changed significantly or ceased trading. That relationship with your primary authority contact is what keeps the partnership functioning properly. If that relationship isn't maintained, then the partnership can fail, changes can happen, and it will damage the overall primary authority partnership you have in place. So at this time, especially making that call to a business to see how they're doing, are they still trading, and being in a position to support them when you're able to. And finally, in terms of the, what I've said of the basics, are enforcement questions. How are enforcement questions against one of your primary authority businesses managed? So primary authority staff should be able to undertake their role with integrity and objectivity. Um, again, that's a quote from the statutory guidance. So um, when you have enforcement questions against a primary authority, is it managed solely by that primary authority officer? Is it passed to an enforcement officer who doesn't have that engagement with the business to avoid that potential bias? Obviously, the primary authorities know the business and are able to comment, but is it a fair and transparent process? Is it recorded? Is there a separation of functions? If there is a complaint against a primary authority business from another regulator, it's very easy. And again, I've been in the situation that you are working with a primary authority business. You, in most cases, want to defend them if you could have a good working relationship. There should be, when there are enforcement challenges, um, a theoretical or it's often referred to as a Chinese or paper wall where if it is a proper enforcement question, an enforcement officer should deal with it rather than that primary authority contact in order to keep the separation between the two and the fair, impartial and transparent process. Moving on to costs. This is obviously one of the main reasons that allows primary authority to function and as a local authority, you can only recover the costs that are reasonably incurred in providing the support to your primary authority partner. One of the questions for the MOT health check is how often do you actually review your cost recovery fees beyond a simple annual percentage increase? Um, and are the fee the way that your cost recovery fees calculated transparent. It's required in the statutory guidance to publish your cost recovery policy, um, but when was the last time you actually fully reviewed it? Does it include all reasonably incurred costs to provide the primary authority service? I'd like to thank Michelle Manson from Surrey Trading Standards, who's recently done some work on how they calculate their costs and there's a series of questions that you could go through. Um, how do you calculate your officer rate? Do you consider the officer's actual productive time rather than just the 37 hour week? So does it encompass training time, the breaks that they should have throughout the day, holidays, sickness, all of those elements when working out what is their actual productive time in order to supply primary authority advice and support. How do you function the billing and admin services backing up that main officer? Are they charged separately? Are they included in the officer rate? Again, how you manage that needs to be transparent and businesses should be able to ask for how you've calculated those costs. In terms of cost as well, how do you recover the cost for acquiring and nominating partnerships? Do you have marketing material, promotional material? All of that is costs incurred to provide a primary authority service. 
And finally, how do you manage contingencies in the continuity of the service? How do you maintain the expertise now and in the future? You could include elements of training. What about trainees, apprenticeships? All of these elements are required to enable you to provide a competent, qualified officer to provide primary authority advice. And it's reasonable to consider those when you're calculating your costs. Finally, if you charge an annual fee, how do you manage this? I know many authorities don't do this, but some do charge an annual fee or an upfront fee. And do businesses get what they pay for? For example, you may include within that a certain amount of free hours of advice. If the business doesn't receive that, do they get their money back? Do you have a system in place where you will ensure that that time is used, either with meeting the businesses, having some annual reviews, some general engagement with them? But if they paid up front for three hours of advice and they don't receive three hours of advice, then they have a fairly good argument that they should get that money back. Again, I'm not here to give you the answers because how you calculate your own costs for the provision of your primary authority service are up to you. But for those that are new to the scheme, I would definitely recommend speaking to other colleagues who've been providing primary authority for some time in order to be able to set up a robust and transparent cost recovery basis. Giving advice. This is obviously one of the main elements of primary authority. So as I've touched on before, do you review your primary authority advice? Is that before it's published or does an officer write the advice and publish it without anyone proofreading it, doing a sense check? The primary authority advice should be reviewed at appropriate intervals. Again, do you build that in at the point you provide the advice? Do you have regular reviews when you engage with the company? And if you do have a review 18 months down the line, is that the same person who wrote the advice or someone else? In some cases, you may be lucky to have someone to the level of expertise to be able to review that advice. In which case, could you ask a colleague from another authority to do so? The primary authority regional groups may be a forum where this can develop. If you're challenged by an enforcing authority or other regulator, could you show your working and the reasoning to demonstrate that you've considered all the elements when you reach your decision? Often published primary authority advice can be quite short, but when you're challenged, can you actually show how you reach that decision? Finally, for anyone that was on our session earlier today on EU exit, I just wanted to reiterate the fact that we've now had it confirmed that there's no need to rewrite primary authority advice if it references the European Communities Act, for example. When you review the advice at whichever point, the legislation may change, but at this point and going at the end of transition into next year, there's no need to rewrite that advice. The next point is resilience. How do you manage the resilience of your advice provision? Oh, sorry, someone's just popped up. Sorry, there. Yeah, how do you manage the resilience? Um, how would you cope with a surge of work? If you have main primary authority offices, what would you do if they're off sick for two weeks? Um, again, the, the answers are for you to determine what's right for your authority. But for example, have you considered partnering with another local authority through, for example, a memorandum of understanding where you support each other, that you have some kind of arrangement where if there is a surge of work, if there is an officer off sick, you can get them to do some support work for you and that enables you to service your clients and provide the primary authority advice whilst maintaining that resilience within your department. The other option is the use of contractors or even retired officers, having somebody on a retainer or an agreement with them that you can approach them for pay as you go advice. Um, again, is a resource there that you can call on if you need to. 
Finally, in terms of advice, um, do you have good links with other primary authority providers in your area? So that includes trading standards, environmental health, fire service, to ensure that you're joined up and not duplicating. Do you have links with the growth hubs, economic development officers? All of this included within your PA offering will make it a better offering. If you know, for example, as a fire officer, if they get, if you get asked the trading standards environmental health question, do you know who to go to? Do you have a colleague that you can pick up the phone and help your partner connect with the right regulator? Equally, growth hubs can offer access to grants and support, mentoring from other businesses. All of those can help to support the partnership. Measuring quality. We all know the adage, what gets measured gets managed, or what gets measured gets done. Um, what quality measures do you use? Um, we all need, know the need to justify our resources while we're spending time and money doing primary authority. We don't have the resources to um, manage that. Obviously, in the last year, resources have been incredibly stretched for all regulators and many of the business as usual just isn't happening. But in terms of justifying the primary authority support, which we certainly recognise as valuable to many businesses, um, what key indicators do you use? Is it the number of partners, the number of active partners, the number of hours of advice you provide, the income that's generated? Um, is the amount of advice published treated differently to the amount of advice you actually issue, the hours issued. Also, do you consider the value to the business? It's a very difficult concept to try and put a figure on, but if you can get some help from the businesses to quantify the money that they've saved through your advice, then all of that can help you internally demonstrate the value of primary authority. And as a commercial service, it is something that you should be able to justify, not only in terms of this is the income we've generated for the authority, but this is the value to the business. And that value can also be to the local authority in terms of local authority priorities, business engagement, support for the local economy. Do you use surveys, for example? How often do you do this? Annually, quarterly, monthly, of all of your partners, some of your partners? And what do you use this information for? You can use it for performance management of the officers providing primary authority, but you can use it in your marketing, being able to push forward that here are some quotes from primary authority partners. This is the amount of advice we've provided. This is the value we've provided to certain businesses. Um, and being able to demonstrate the value of what you're doing, because I know there are still some within the regulatory community and within local authorities that maybe see regulators shouldn't be working with businesses, we should be regulating. But obviously working with businesses in, is a much better way to ensure compliance. And I think most of us that work within this field clearly see the value of it. So some final considerations. Um, how do you sell yourself? It's something that, oh, sorry, okay, slides have gone running again. Sorry, yes, how do you sell yourselves? Um, do you have particular marketing material? Is there clearly on your website some information about your primary authority, what you deliver, your partners, the level of service that you deliver, the value of the service do you deliver? Do you have examples of the work that you've done? Case studies, videos, it's very easy to put on websites if you've got friendly companies, not only does it help them promote their work, but also the value of the work that you do. It's something I've been involved in, but equally, this is an area that we appreciate is often difficult for regulators, for local authorities. 
marketing your services in a commercial way is not the skill set that we have. We are regulators and that's where our expertise is. But how you manage the marketing of your service is a crucial component in the market that's developed. We know that some authorities are very good at selling their services. They have professional looking marketing materials. In a lot of cases, these are the larger authorities that have heavily invested in primary authority. So they are able to have those. Equally, there are certain circumstances where a business will ask local authorities to pitch for their business. It's something that with the development of our primary authority regional groups, if we are approached by a business seeking a primary authority partner, we will approach the regional group in that area in most cases, seeking expressions of interest. At that point, the business may receive three, four, five more expressions of interest from local authorities in their area, and they are then in the driving seat to choose who they want to pursue the exploration of a partnership with. If you're not able to market yourselves in an effective way, losing out on those potential partners. It's something that is on our to-do list, if you like, to review, could we at OPSS provide some sort of support or training or a masterclass to help local authorities better promote and market their services? If you're interested in that, I'd be very welcome to uh, put some links down in the, in the chat. So please, if you are interested in possible training in relation to marketing your services, please just make a note. Uh, data handling and Freedom of Information Act requests. This is something where it's often only considered when there's a problem. So we know recently a number of local authorities have received Freedom of Information Act requests looking for details of a partnership, looking for all the advice that's been published under that partnership. And in a lot of cases, it wasn't something that had been considered. So what would you do with that request? When you receive a Freedom of Information Act request, do you hold the information or would you classify it all as confidentially, uh, sorry, commercially sensitive and therefore confidential? Are you able to and engagement with your own uh, information officers at your local authorities? can obviously help you with that. How you work with the information that your partner gives you is also worth considering. I know some authorities write in to their primary authority agreements with their partners that all information is confidential, that all information will be deleted after the provision of the advice. Equally, many businesses don't want you to hold the information because they deem it so commercially sensitive and through the use of technology, they will allow you to access it in the cloud, for example. The balance there is that you obviously have enough information not only to give the advice that you're being asked for, but also, as you mentioned earlier, if you're challenged later on, do you hold sufficient information to demonstrate how you reached the advice that you issued? And as we mentioned, do you have confidentiality clauses in your primary authority contract? If you don't, is that something you should consider? And engaging with your information officers to be aware that if we're asked the question, we may have to disclose this information. I think sort of almost bringing it to, to an end now, resources and backfilling, that's always a very difficult question. Um, Primary authority demand grows, offices can be taken away for what some people see as the day job, although primary authority and supporting businesses is the day job. Um, but it can be seen by, by others as separate to regulating businesses. But being taken away from that, obviously capacity is reduced. And as an authority, is there a plan to manage this? If primary authority grows, if you get a surge in requests from businesses and you have to take offices away from the day job, is there a system in place to manage it? Would you look, for example, to recruit a contractor? 
would you take people off other work in order to backfill the work of a primary authority officer? And going forward, is there a plan to backfill officers taken away from the regulatory, the inspection, the compliance work to work with primary authorities? Is there a certain point where you would look to recruit to a post or to backfill a post? If so, what is that point? Is it the sort of thing where there is a plan? There may not be a plan, but it's certainly something that should be within people's thought process that without, without a plan, it's very easy to end up not knowing where your position is and sleepwalking into under-resourcing and either having to choose not to support your primary authorities as effectively as you would like to or to reduce the amount of compliance work. So having a plan at what point do we need to look to recruit further, either into a primary authority role or into a, a regulatory role. Right, this is my last slide, so hopefully we might get some questions in the chat. I'm not keeping an eye on that, but please, now's your time to start asking. So this is the last slide. Where would I want you to go from here? So go and review your primary authority provision. The question is by who, when, what are they looking at? That's a decision for you in terms of your authority, the officers you've got, the priority it takes over everything else that we're all having to deal with. But trying to have a plan, at what point will somebody start to, to look at this? And I would very much encourage you for a lot of the things to have it as a regular review the primary authority. Whether you review your fees annually, every two years, but things like advice provision, officer competence, they are essential for you to be able to provide a proper primary authority advice service. So having a plan, making the connections. If you've not connected to your growth hubs, development offices, the Better Business for All groups, then you're missing out on all of those additional benefits. Primary authority groups are definitely something every authority involved within primary authority should be involved in. Even if you're just signed up to the mailing list and you can't attend the meetings, so far the meetings are only meeting every three, four months and we've only just started. But engaging with colleagues that are delivering primary authority across your region so you can share best practice, build those connections and build the resilience if you need it. Support in terms of there, what support would you need from us at OPSS? We all have a, a, a region, so we have regional contacts. Myself, I cover the West Midlands. My colleague Caroline, who's also on this, uh, she supports the East Midlands. But we have regional contacts with the whole of England and Wales. Uh, I don't believe we've properly engaged as a specific contact for Scotland. Um, and equally, I'm starting to engage with Northern Ireland. All of the details of the contacts are within the primary authority news. But please, if you need some support, use us. As I've mentioned, training on marketing might be something that you would think is of great value. It may be that all you want is a refresher training for new officers on the basic provision of primary authority. It may be that you don't actually deliver primary authority and you would like some training as an enforcer which of course every local authority is also an enforcing authority regardless of whether they provide primary authority advice or not and in relation to primary authority news we're always looking for articles to include in there they don't need to be long but examples of where you've worked with businesses where you've delivered primary authority advice whether you've created a, a resilience network to support you all, anything like that, please share with us because this is how we promote the work of primary authority. This is how we can support you. The more we understand, then the better we're able to support. And the best email address there, pa at bays.gov.uk, 
that's the good general email. But as I've said, each region has their own contact. The details of that are within the PA News, um, which I think the last three or four editions has included all those contacts. Right, thank you very much for listening to me go on with my thoughts. We will uh, share the slides around um, so you can see the notes that I've made, the, the thoughts that I've had um, as someone that has done primary authority, encouraging you to look at this MOT, health check, whatever you want to call it. Um, Caroline, has there been any questions or comments in the chat? Yes, been quite active, which is great. Um, so JJ from Buckinghamshire Fire has asked, do you want to offer any recommendations for revoking silent or inactive partnerships? Um, and I don't know whether you want to take that, Stuart, or? I think the, the, first, the first question is, why are they silent partnerships? Is it because the business is no longer there, doesn't want to engage with you anymore? I certainly know from my experience, often you will get businesses come and sign up to a primary authority because they want advice in relation to one specific element, and then they're not interested in primary authority anymore. So the first question is, when was the last time you tried to engage with them to try and keep that partnership active? But it is a difficult decision because being able to say, we've got 50 primary authority businesses, but actually only 10 of them are active, is a, is a difficult question. So trying to engage with them and ultimately, if they're silent, are they costing you money? Are you dealing with inquiries? But in some cases, if you're not getting a partnership engagement with the business, do you make the decision that actually we're not interested in having this partnership anymore because we can't engage with the business for whatever reason? And then revoking the partnership may be a, a choice, but it's a, a question of why the partnership is silent and why the partnership isn't engaging. First question. Just, just to add to that, uh, Stuart, there has been a focus over the years on the number of partnerships um, and we do obviously monitor the numbers of partnerships, but it's more of a focus on the quality of partnerships. So if you're not able to engage effectively with your partnership, it, the drive is usually from the PA to keep that partnership active, have some engagement with them. So maybe when you review partnerships on an annual basis and set objectives for that year, booking quarterly meetings, it might might not be a huge agenda but have that interaction and kind of look for areas to work with the business on to keep them engaged and it is usually led by uh, the primary authority the activity in the partnership um, and if it's not working and not a true partnership and just a paper partnership um, with dare I say the potential to be used as a shield uh, which obviously primary authority isn't a shield against enforcement action um, and you need to have those discussions about where the partnership's future uh, lies. So uh, there's also um, Adrian's asked about any good examples of quality measures for PAs, please. I think quality measures are in a way dependent on the, the types of partnerships that you're doing. It's you can easily do some metrics around this is many hours we build for this quarter, this is many active partnerships. In terms of quality, then it may be in relation to reduction of complaints, for example. That might be a value that your partnership has brought um, from, you know, we've had a 50% reduction in complaints against this business since we've engaged with the primary authority. I think this, these sort of questions around how people measure themselves is an ideal question for the primary authority regional groups. It's not something we can impose on you um, because it's not a one size fits all. But the regional group is an ideal forum for people to have those discussions around what they measure and how do they um, include quality. And in terms of practical measures, using colleagues to review advice to make sure that you're giving quality advice um, may be something to consider. I don't know whether Caroline, you have any thoughts? Um, the things that I've measured in the past with PA partnerships 
is asking the businesses how many premises is covered are covered by their partnerships how many employees so things like fire safety and health and safety you can say this number of employees are protected visitors customers um and it's something that elected members always like to know those kind of figures and we're asked a lot at the minute about quantifying the value of, of primary authority i'm a big fan of case studies putting what the um what's happening with partner business into into life and giving examples of that i've had some great ones from the fire service which was uh, difficult to tease out of them because they just see it as business as usual which is very commendable but from an outside trade and standards background i think a lot of the work is amazing so i'm I'm really um, a big fan of case studies to show the quality and the impact it has on residents and care homes, for example, customers, visitors. Um, so, policy measures for PA, there's, there is a piece of work that's went on a couple of years ago. I don't know if that's going to be repeated about quality in um, in PA. But we'll have a look at that. Um, and from the from the chat as well, it's good to see that um, JJ is making move for some specialised housing partnerships. Um, I will take a mental note of that because there's a big demand in that area, as you know. Um, and as you picked up, Stuart, on the chat, there's lots of interest in marketing advice um, and support. So I think that's something we need to look into. Um, and the questions Michelle's asked for the page number. I don't know them off my heart, Michelle, in case you think I'm really tragic um, on the in the statutory guidance for where the guidance says that they have to be competent in uh, offices to deliver partnership, but I've sent that link on. Um, so mentioned about um, RSL's social services that much um, who are at the moment and COVID hasn't helped either. So that's kind of um, Anything else on there, Stuart? Adrian, my organisation is looking to develop new PA partnership and would welcome assistance regarding developing these. That's one of my work streams. So Stuart and I, a lot of our work streams overlap. Um, I'm looking at um, development of new primary authority providers and not just a toolkit, but support um, from me initially and then handing over to your regional lead um, to develop new PA partnerships and development. So, if you want to drop me a line on that one, I'll be happy to help. And likewise, if you need support. Um, don't pay uh, case studies, JJ, because you're very good at them. Um, so when you do, I think that's everything in the chat, unless there's any other questions. Right. Quite an active group. That's quite good. So, yeah. Thank you very much for those. Um, there's clearly some interest for something around marketing, so we'll definitely take that away and add it to our to-do list. Um, I would, as I've said a number of times, encourage you all, if you're not, to get involved in your primary authority regional groups. Uh, the contacts within the primary authority news which is always looking for articles. There is a word limit per article, so it is literally a couple of paragraphs. So anything you're doing with PA helps, not only helps us promote what's going on in the PA space, but also if you feature in PA News, which is a, obviously a national publication that we push out, it recognises the work for PA within central government, which within the COVID crisis is being certainly highly recognised, but also you might want to use it internally to demonstrate that the work that you're doing is being nationally recognised, because we all appreciate the pressures local authorities are under, more so than, than any time in the last, well, certainly my career, which is over 20 years, that the pinch on local authorities with the situation of the world at the moment, anything you can do to justify the, the work that you're delivering, um, can only be a benefit. So, any news stories, but yeah, certainly engage with your primary authority regional groups. And as I say, one of the takeaways from this session is please just go and think about how you manage the primary authority rather than deliver it. How often do you review your costs? How often do you look at the advice that you've already issued? And just coming up with a plan on how we manage the service.
Um, there is going to be a recording of this session and uh, I think we can circulate the slides to the, the group. In fact, I'm going to see if I can just drop them into the chat now. No, it won't let me. Um, but yes, we can try and circulate the slides because that's got all the little notes I had at the bottom that I, I spoke around. But if there's no other questions, thank you very much for joining us uh, this Wednesday afternoon. And have a nice rest of your afternoon. We've got last day of sessions tomorrow. Hopefully we might see some of you there. Thank you very much. Goodbye.